So I think the article that you guys sent around was one related to uh, an oncology treatment that uses mRNA tech. But I I think it's what what I wanted to kind of what I thought would be interesting to talk about for a second is just zooming out on mRNA technology as a whole, um, which, you know, has been theorized for, you know, the the, the potential of it's been talked about for 50 years. Um, If we talk about real quick what what RNA is, remember your DNA, your genetic code, uh, you know, defines... um, the uh, uh, the printing of proteins in your cells. And so every three letters of DNA is, is an amino acid, a bunch of amino acids in a, in a row form a protein, and that protein has some function in your body. The way that the DNA gets translated into protein is through these mRNA snippets. So a little snippet of RNA is a copy of DNA, which floats over from the DNA strand, and it floats into what's called the ribosome, and the ribosome is the protein printer in the cell. And there's lots of ribosomes and there's lots of RNA floating around all the time and it's being copied over. So some chemical triggers the expression of that gene of that sequence of DNA into RNA that then turns into protein. And so a chemical induces the protein, then the protein does something interesting. And the protein has a function in your body. And some of those proteins in human body can, you know, do bad things and some of them can do good things. And so the idea has always been that we can actually use proteins as a way to modulate our health and modulate disease. For example, creating a protein that can attach to cancer cells and signal immune cells to come and kill those cancer cells, as an example. And some people have genetic problems where their DNA prints the wrong protein. And then that protein is malformed or causes some harm to your health. And so the idea for RNA technology has always been that instead of having... DNA be the source of truth for the proteins that get expressed in your body, can we stick RNA directly into cells and use that RNA to trigger the production of proteins that can do specific things in your body? And remember, the biggest segment of the pharma market or a huge segment of the pharma market is what's called biologic drugs, which are largely antibodies, which are a type of protein that have some specific function. But very many of these proteins are hard to get into the body and get them into the right place and get them to do the things we want them to do. So it would be a lot easier if we could get RNA into the right cells to get those cells to make the right protein to do that thing that we want them to do. Mm. So everything from cancer treatment to genetic diseases, um, uh, and there's RNA interference, and there's um, RNA, or what are called oligonucleotides that can be used to block specific bad proteins from being produced in your cells. Um, or it's kind of another kind of course of treatment. So making proteins that we think are therapeutic and blocking the production of bad proteins are kind of the, the mainstay of this idea behind RNA technology. And Moderna was started to pursue this effort out of flagship pioneering, which is an incubation shop in, in, in Boston. Um, and they really kind of struggled for years to find the right footing of what's the right business model and the right product. And the, and the FDA kind of struggled with approving this stuff. And then boom, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, it was like, holy crap, let's accelerate this RNA technology, use it for vaccines, which had been in development for years. And the protein that's being produced is the same protein you find on the the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which triggers an immune response and builds up your immunity to that virus. And now the floodgates are open. And this is incredible because the frontiers in RNA over the next decade could change the course of how we treat disease um, and change the course of, um, uh, of outcomes for many diseases from genetic diseases all the way through to cancers. Mm. Um, and so we're starting to see those floodgates open. I think there's now a few, a handful of these, uh, you know, uh, RNA interference um, products that have been approved by the FDA. And we're now starting to see many more of these cancer and immunotherapy drugs start to get approved uh, as RNA um, uh, therapies. But it really, uh, I think, was lit by, um, uh, by the breakthrough with COVID and everyone kind of seeing the benefit of this and the lack of side effects. And we've now got... Uh, I think a validation in the market and acceptance from consumers that this technology could transform the industry in the same way that Genentech transformed the pharma industry with biologic drugs in the um, 80s and 90s. So it's super exciting. Um, and, you know, we, we can do updates regularly on our show if you guys want to talk about more of the cool stuff that's coming out. But man, this is going to transform how medicine is delivered and, and the potential of things that we can kind of trade. Let me ask you a question. Would the if we looked at the total number of deaths from COVID, and then the potential debt, you know, deaths avoided or early deaths or more life days added, however you want to do it, from mRNA and the impact on cancer over the next, say, 30, 40 years, in other words, the impact it would have on the people living today who live through COVID, do you think net net, uh, will see that the prevention of cancers through this new technology could actually make 
you know, uh, be basically the silver lining to what happened during COVID? It's a good question. Um, let me give you the counterpoint. Uh, in the late 90s, there was a, a gene editing um, clinical trial that took place. And they tried to, uh, and, and a patient, and they, and they delivered the gene editing technology via virus. And so the virus goes in, it spreads around, and it, and it has this, this, this molecule that would edit the gene, and, and, and it was for a genetic disease. And a patient that they gave it to, a young guy, got this, uh, this virus, and he actually died from it. And they shut down all clinical trials oh. for years. And it was like, boom, that's the end. So um, there, there are a lot of scientists, a lot of doctors have argued for years that that particular case caused so many lives to be lost because we lost years of progress in being able to run clinical trials during that time and get drugs to market that could treat people. And you're right, maybe the opposite has happened here, that while these clinical trials may have taken years and years and years to get through in a normal setting, perhaps the pandemic was the accelerant we needed to mm. get more of these to market faster and millions of people whose lives would have been lost or would be lost otherwise to cancer and other uh, genetic diseases and so on over the years to come will be saved because these therapies will get to market faster. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. And, and maybe I don't know what the calculus is between the lives lost in the pandemic versus the lives gained via these treatments coming to market faster. But it's, it's certainly a good way I mean, to think the, about it. The, the, the way to look at it, we can look at the days of life lost, right? And if we actually could actually predict how long somebody's gonna live. And the, you know, extension of life, I, I think we can come out of this ahead. Uh, finally, 